You know, there's an old, old song that was really popular back in the 1960s. Uh, it was popular even in the 1970s. Um, there's the song that's named, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love. Uh, Jars of Clay about 10 years ago revived that song, and, and it was good about 10 years ago as well. Today, however, when you stop and think about it, the word love, it's been overshadowed by all the hatred and the violence in our streets. You see it on social media. I see it every single day on social media. It happens every day. It happens every night. It happened last night all across America. People hating people. People hating people. And I think the message of First John is a perfect message for our culture today. And you can, you can shrink the message of 1 John, all five chapters, you can shrink that message down to three words in 1 John, and those words are these, love one another. Love one another. You see, John writes this book in order to change the trajectory of our lives from resentment and hatred and murder to loving and accepting and helping. Now, here's a principle that I'm going to go back to several times today as we look at 1 John chapter 3. The principle is this, and please take note of this, what you are determines what you see. What you see determines what you do. What you are determines what you see, and what you see determines what you do. Now, how many of you are cat lovers? How many just love cats? I'll be honest with you, I'm not a cat person. I won't tell you any of my cat jokes because they're really, really mean. I love dogs. Oh, I love dogs. But cats are not my favorite. Stop and think about cats. What do, what do, what do cats do? Cats chase mice, right? In fact, my granddad, growing up, I spent a lot of time on the farm with Grandpa, and in one of his barns was a hayloft, and he had, he had mice all over that hayloft, all over that barn, but he also had a lot of cats as well. And cats are mousers. Cats chase mice. That's how they're programmed from the very beginning, right? They're mousers, and since they are mousers, that's what they see. And having seen them at their best, that's what cats do. They chase mice. You see, everything starts in the heart. It goes to the head. After the head, it goes out to the hands. It's what we do. You see, what you, what you are determines what you see. What you see determines what you do. Now, our text today is found in 1 John chapter 3. I hope you brought your Bibles. Open them up to 1 John chapter 3. That's right at the back of your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, just click on your Bible app. And there you'll be able to find 1 John chapter 3. We're going to pick it up in verse 11. There John writes these words. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. John said, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. What's he talking about from the beginning? Is he talking about going all the way back to the beginning of time? Is that it? No, that's not it at all. You see, what he's doing is this. He's remembering back to the Last Supper with Jesus. Remember the Last Supper of Jesus in John chapter 13? Jesus said to the disciples, I'm giving you a new commandment that you should love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. You see, John's remembering back to that day. It's been about 60 years for him. It's taxing his memory probably, but guess what? He remembers back to that day. He remembers from the, from the beginning of the relationship that he had with Jesus Christ. He said, I've witnessed that kind of love in Jesus. I've seen that kind of love firsthand in Jesus. I've seen it with my own eyes being around Jesus. Remember the woman who was caught in adultery? They, 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 they caught her in the very act of adultery, and they brought her. They brought her out to the city square, if you will. Everybody standing around her. Jesus was there, and Jesus did not compromise his ethics. He did not compromise his beliefs, his values, and Jesus pretty much told that lady to, 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 to go. I forgive you of your sins. Go and don't sin like that anymore. And then he said to the people standing around her, ready with stones in hand to stone her to death, he said, don't one of you throw a stone at her. 
Not one of you. You see, Jesus did not compromise his ethics. He did not compromise his values. Remember Peter, one of the disciples, one of the apostles? Remember him? The night before Jesus was crucified, Peter denied even knowing Jesus, not once, not twice, but how many times? Three different times. I don't know who the man is. I don't know who you're talking about. And yet, in spite of his denial three times, Jesus still loved him. Jesus still died for him on the cross, regardless of what he said. Jesus loved him all the way to the cross. And so John says, he says, this is the message you've had from the beginning. And then in verse 12, he goes on to say, we should not, and this is an interesting twist here. He said, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, there's something here about John's writing style you, might, you, you probably ought to know. He loves to use contrasts. The Apostle John, in his writing style, loves to use contrasts, and he uses them quite a bit. Light and dark, love and hate, obedience, disobedience. He also uses light and dark and love and truth and lies. He uses those quite a bit. And what he's doing is this. He, he highlights the negative in order to promote the positive. He highlights the negative in order to emphasize the positive. You point out that which is not acceptable, and there it brings up that which is acceptable. And he says, not Cain. Oh, don't be like Cain. Please don't be like Cain. Well, what about Cain? Come on, what about Cain? Well, it says he was of the evil one. Now, you and I both know, don't you? To say something like that today is not politically correct. Oh, he's of the evil one. He's of Satan. It's not, it's not politically correct, but it is biblically correct. It doesn't say in the text that he didn't come from a good home. It doesn't say in the text that he was a victim of his circumstances. It says in the text that, that Cain was of the evil one and he murdered his brother. Murdered his brother. Now, let's look very briefly at that word murder. In the Greek language, the word murder comes from the word spazo. Spazo, hold on to your hankies, ladies. The word spazo in the Greek language means to butcher. To butcher. He butchered his brother. Now, I've been around, I didn't grow up on a farm. I spent a lot of time with my granddad on the farm and um, around farming communities hunting and that kind of thing, one of the things you do right after you kill an animal is you bleed them out. And one of the ways you bleed them out is you slit their throat, the jugular. And so what he probably did was he slit his throat before he butchered him. He murdered his brother. He murdered him. That's what the text tells us. And why did he do it? According to the text, because his deeds were evil. Why did he do it? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. What's it, what does it mean that his, that, his, that his brother's deeds were righteous? What's that mean? Well, he did that which was right. That's what the text says. Remember this? We talked about it a couple of times already. What you are determines what you see. What you see determines what you do. Now, let's briefly go back to the book of Genesis, to that very first family who walked on the face of the earth. You've got Adam... Eve and their two sons, Cain and Abel. Abel was a shepherd. Cain was a guy who worked the ground. He was a farmer. And Genesis chapter 4 tells us that in the course of time, Cain brought an offering to God from the ground, and Abel brought an offering to God from his flock. And it says, too, that Abel's gift, Abel's offering to God, was accepted by God. However, Cain's gift, Cain's offering to God, was not accepted. Now, let me deviate a little bit from the text this morning. Let's say you're sitting at the kitchen table before you go to work, or maybe you're sitting at the kitchen table right before you go to bed. You're reading your Bible, and, 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 and as you read your Bible, there are places that you're reading that where you need to stop and you need to think about what you just read. And this is one of those places. 
You see, when you read your Bible, the goal in reading your Bible is not to get to the end of the chapter in record time. It's not to get to the end of the book in record time. The goal in reading your Bible is to understand it as best you can. And the natural question in this text here is why in the world would God not accept one offering and yet accept the other offering? Why is that? Well, I've looked in the Bible, and I've looked in the Bible, and I've looked in the Bible, and I can't find a reason as to why he accepted Abel's gift but did not accept Cain's gift. I can't, I can't find out why. And so if you're caught in that kind of a situation, you're left to make your own assumptions. You're left to draw your own conclusions. And apparently, these two young men, Cain and Abel, apparently they had been taught the value of an offering. And apparently, the Lord made it clear to them that he wanted a blood offering. He wanted a blood offering. And I think this is a hint as to what may come thousands of years after this incident. It's a foreshadowing of what's going to happen when Jesus is crucified. You see, Jesus Christ is our blood offering. Jesus was crucified and His blood saves us from our sins. I mean, when, when, when they were taught the teaching about the, about the blood offering, Cain heard it. Abel heard it. Abel obeyed and Cain did not. And the Lord accepted Abel's offering, but the Lord did not accept Cain's offering. And the result of that, well, you can look back in the text, Genesis chapter 4, Cain became angry. Cain pretty much said, God, I know what you said, but look what I brought. Oh, God, look what I brought. I've worked long and hard for this offering that I'm giving to you with a sincere heart. But, God, it makes me angry that you would accept my little brother's gift and not accept mine. God, it makes me angry. And according to Genesis 4, 5, he was angry. But it just doesn't say he was angry. It means that he was very, very angry. He was fuming inside so much so that you could see it on the outside. Some Bibles say that his countenance fell. You could see it on his face. His emotions took over. And God said to him, hey, listen, Cain, come on. I'll accept your offering if you just do it right. The anger will go away. But God goes on to say this. God goes on to say, if you don't do what's right... Sin is crouching at your door. In other words, sin wants to control your life. Cain's sin wants to control your life. I mean, you talk about relevant today. Sin wants to control your life. Sin wants to control my life. This last week, I had lunch with a fella from church, single guy. And as we were eating lunch, he was on his cell phone occasionally, you know, texting this and texting that. And one time he laid his phone down at the table. And I happened to look over. My eyes about popped out of my head. He had a picture on his phone of a scantily clad No, he had a picture on his phone of a young woman with a see-through blouse on. I picked the phone up just to make sure I wasn't, you know, yeah, that's what it was. I said, what's this? I had his phone in my hand. What's this? You call yourself a Christ follower. You call yourself a Christian. You love Jesus, and you have these kinds of pictures on your phone. He grabs the phone from my hand. He starts doing this and doing that. Lynn, I got it off. I'm really, really sorry. I I am so sorry. I said, I hope you've erased it from your phone. Yes, I've erased it from my phone. It's not there anymore. I'm really, really sorry. Guys, do you have any of those pictures on your phone? Ladies, do you have any of those pictures on your phone? Understand, sin 
wants to control you. It's crouching at your door, ready to pounce. We've got another guy in our church who works in one of the factories. <clears throat> he, doesn't have, <laughs> he, he doesn't have a smartphone. He said the reason he doesn't have a smartphone is because he doesn't want all those other yahoos in the plant to send him any pictures, any jokes, anything that he does not need to see. Because he knows sin is trying to control him. Sin is crouching at his door. And sin is trying to control you. And sin is crouching at your door. If you've got something like that on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, I'm telling you what, you need to get rid of that right today. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Do it today, immediately when you get home. Or if it's on your phone, on your tablet, do it immediately. Because sin wants to control you. Just like sin controlled Cain. Satan took control of his life. Sin took control of his life. And he murdered his brother. Or to use that word that we see in the Greek, he butchered his brother. Cain was cursed by God for the rest of his life. Remember what you are determines what you do. Cain was evil. When you combine evil with envy and resentment, it very well may result in murder. And then John goes on from verse 12 to verse 13, and this is what he says. He says, don't be surprised, brothers, and I might add here, sisters, don't be surprised that the world hates you. John is turning the corner now from talking about Cain to talking about and focusing on the world system that Satan controls. And by the way, the only reason that Satan controls the world system is because God allows him to do that. He's focusing on the world system. Why would the world hate Christians? Are we bad people? Why would the world hate Christians? Because Christians work hard at living the right kind of life or a righteous life. You see, living the right kind of life throws a spotlight on those people in the world, those people that you work with, that you hang out with. Living the right kind of life throws, throws a light on their lives that aren't right. And Cain, I think, can be viewed as a prototype of our world today. The world hates you because you're living the right kind of a life. And the world despises Christians, doesn't it? It really does. I mean, you're a marked person. You show up to work as a Christian. You desire to serve Jesus Christ with the right kind of life. And you're a marked person. I've worked in factories. I've worked in front offices of businesses. You may not know this, but people behind your back say things like this. They say things like, who does she think she is? Little Miss Goody Two-Shoes. Who does he think he is, holier than thou? Understand, the world does not like you. And before Jesus left the earth, Jesus says, you need to know this. You need to know that the world hates me. And because the world hates me, it's going to hate you too. John brings us another lesson from Jesus, and the, and, the, and the lesson is this, don't be surprised. Just don't be surprised that the world hates you. Don't be surprised by that. The word surprised, it, it literally means stop being surprised. Just quit being surprised about this stuff. Cut it out, being surprised. I mean, how many times do we, do we see the news? Do we read the news? Do we watch the news? How many times do we do that and we say, I can't believe it. What's the world coming to today? Jesus is going, hey, don't be surprised about it. It's going to happen. Just like I said it's going to happen. And persecution of Christians, that's going on all over the world, even though we don't hear about it. 
is especially rough now in China. It's happening in the United States. And John says, don't be surprised about it. When I was a youth pastor years ago, a, a, a friend of mine in his church, he had, a, he had a, uh, a kid who was like 14 or 15 years old, a boy. The kid was a Christian, not an obnoxious kind of kid at all. But in his high school, he had to go to his classroom at the end of the hall. There's the only way to get there. He had to walk the gauntlet. He walked the gauntlet to get to his classroom. And by the time he got to the end of the, of the hallway, they called the ambulance because he was that bad. He was in the hospital for about a week or so. And the worst injury that he received is that the kids walking down that hallway, some of them grabbed their, put their fingers in his mouth on both sides, and they pulled. And his cheeks were ripped all the way back to his jawbone. Persecution goes on, even in the United States of America, even though we don't hear about it. And, 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 and John and Jesus both go, hey, listen, don't be surprised. It happens. Now, where are we going with all this? <laughs> if you ask that question, great question to ask. Where are we going with all of this? Look at verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life. Well, how do we know? He says, because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever does not love lives in death. Now, there in verse 14, the first word we, that's referring to Christians, followers of Jesus Christ. He's saying as followers of Jesus Christ, you have passed out of a walking dead-like existence. Anybody a fan of the TV show, Walking Dead? Wow, that one up quick, that one up quick. Nobody else likes it? You ever seen it? You're ashamed to raise your hand, right? I think this is the last, uh, the last season for it, I think. Is that right? Uh, it's all about zombies, all about, you know, walking dead, eating, walking, living, I guess, you know. But what John is saying here is this. He's saying as followers of Jesus Christ, we have passed out of this walking dead-like existence, and now we're walking in life. Now we're walking in the light. Now we're walking with Jesus Christ. It's a different kind of life. He's referring to conversion. He's referring to following Jesus. But how do you know? How do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you're walking in the light? He says it right there in the text. Because we love the brothers and the sisters. We love. We love. And then he goes on to say, whoever doesn't love doesn't, or whoever, whoever doesn't love abides in death or lives in a death-like existence. And here John's not talking about, he's not talking about theory. He's talking about everyday life. He's talking about rubber meets the road kind of stuff. How do people know that you are a Christian? By how you love other people. Do you talk them down? Do you talk behind their back? Do you do things to hurt them? Is the love of Christ in you? How do people know that you're a Christian? It's because of the love that you show to other people. That's your identifying mark, loving one another. What you are determines what you see. You see another Christian who has a need, well, it determines what you do. You help them out. You see, you're putting feet to your love. It gives meaning to the philosophy of living. It proves that you live in the light of Jesus Christ. But check out, remember I mentioned a little bit ago this contrast thing? In verse 14, he's talking about the loving the brothers. In verse 14, talking about loving the brothers. In verse 15, he says, everyone who hates his brother. That's talking about a lifestyle. 
a perpetual, habitual kind of lifestyle of hate and resentment. He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Meaning those who embrace the lifestyle of hatred and resentment, that's how they live their lives. They will live their lives in a prison of sorts with absolutely no hope of getting out and living a life of love and positivity, if that's a word. You see, these people live a death-like existence. They're, they're consumed with retaliation. They're just consumed with getting back at somebody. Now, remember that contrast thing? Verse 14, love. Verse 15, hate. Verse 16 here, by this we know love. By what we know love. Here it is, that He laid His life down for us. Jesus laid His life down for you and for me. That's love. Jesus died for you and for me. That's love. He proved His love for us by dying on a cross. And then he goes on, verses 16 and 17, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and the sisters. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees a brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Now, now here's something I don't want you to miss, and, and, that's, and that's compassion. Your compassion for others proves your love for God. Your compassion for others proves your love for God. How does someone else know that you love God? Because you're helping them out in their time of need. You're helping him, you're helping her out in their time of need. And, and here's something else I don't want you to miss, and it may seem really insignificant, but I think it's pretty important. Paul is moving right here in the text, he's moving from talking about people in, in the plural to talking about people in the singular. You're going, what's the big deal about that? Well, here's the big deal about that. Verse 16, he says, you ought to lay down your lives for your fellow Christians. Amen? Amen. But then in verse 17, he goes on to say, whoever sees a brother, singular, or sister, singular, why does he do that? He does that because of this. He wants to focus on the individual. He wants to focus on the individual. You see, loving everybody can be an excuse to loving nobody. How many people say, well, I love everybody. I love all of our people in our, ch in our church. I love everybody in the community. I love everybody at work. Is that right? You love everybody? Really? You love everybody? Give me a name. Give me a face and tell me what you did. How did you love them? Name, face, and what did you do? A friend of mine uh, who's a preacher <clears throat> um, uh, had an article published in a, in a preaching magazine, a rather scholarly preaching magazine, and I found out about it. I read the article. I really liked the article. Talked a lot about James S. Stewart, one of the preaching greats uh, through the years. And so I, I, I messaged him on, on Messenger and I said, hey, listen. And I wasn't kidding. I said, hey, listen, would you get a copy of that magazine for me and autograph your article? I want a copy of that. And he thought I was joking about it. No, I'm not joking about it at all. I want a copy of that. And he's done some other things that have been published. Um, and so he... After several weeks, got a copy, of the, got several copies of the magazine for other people, and, and he signed mine and wrote a little note to it. And so I got it a couple of weeks ago, and I, I've, I've read it probably three or four times now. It's just a great article. And, and so in, 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 in saying thank you to him, I, 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 I put two $20 bills and a note in an envelope and mailed it back to him just to say, hey, thanks a lot for all your, you know, your time and effort, I pre, you know, shipping and handling, right? Thanks a lot. And so about three or four days later, he sends me a message back. He says, hey, listen, thanks a lot uh, for that money. I, I, I really would, didn't expect you to do that. Didn't expect you to do that at all. But just to let you know what I did with it, 
he said, my wife and I, just the two of them now at the house, he said, we really weren't sure how we were going to have food for the rest of the week. He said, now we have groceries. Thank you. I'm thinking, 40 bucks? 40 bucks? I showed love to the guy not even knowing I was showing love. Not even knowing that I was showing love. Oh, I love everybody. I love everybody. Give me a name, give me a face, and tell me what you did. Tell me what you did in order to love that person. You see, that's a different story. That's a different story. And that's John's point. John goes on in verse 18. He's, this, is, this is what he says. I think this is the last verse for today. He says, hey, little children, let's not love in word or talk. Just don't talk about it, but in deed and truth. Just don't talk about it. Do it. Now, today, I'm, I, I, I don't want us to focus on, you know, what the original meaning means in this, in this word or for that word. I don't want to talk about how sentences are structured. I don't want to talk about necessarily how contrasts are made. It's not about theology. It's about love in action. Love in action. Years ago, when I was a student at Lincoln Christian University, um, I witnessed love in action a number of times. I was a recipient a couple of times of that. And, and on this one wintry afternoon, I was a sophomore. On this one wintry afternoon, um, <clears throat> the snow was coming down like crazy. Um, we had to have six inches of snow on the ground already, and it was just coming down like in buckets. It was one of those big snowstorms that, 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 that came about that we have here in the Midwest. And uh, I noticed as I was coming up to one of the main intersections on campus, I noticed this, this college freshman. Uh, she had a rattle trap of a car. She was in the middle of the intersection, six inches of snow, and just cranking on her. I mean, the car stalled. She couldn't get it started back in. Just kept cranking and cranking. It would not start. And the closer I got to her car, I noticed that all the students were either going to class, going to the bookstore, going back to the dorm. They weren't stopping at her car. And then suddenly, out of the blue, to her rescue, comes Dr. James D. Strauss. Loved that man. Unbelievably brilliant guy. He came to the rescue. He was the head, he was the head of the, the theology and the philosophy department, an utterly brilliant man. And, and, and one time, here's a, here's a little story for you. One time, one of my friends, I stayed there during the summertime to work a, a job for the college, and, and one of my friends happened to be driving by his house in the middle of summer, and he saw Dr. Strauss mowing his yard. Who doesn't mow their yard in the middle of summer, right? All of us do, right? Well, Dr. James D. Strauss was mowing his yard in the middle of summertime. But here is the little caveat. He was mowing his yard in the middle of the summer, in the middle of the day, in his three-piece suit and his wingtips. Who does that? Except for Dr. James D. Strauss, right? I, I, I can remember go, going to his very first class in graduate school, and, and, I, and of course, you know, being the student that I am, I sat there, I had my notebook open, I was trying to take notes and trying to take notes, and I'm thinking, I can't take notes on this guy. I, I don't understand the thing he's saying. And so finally, I just closed up my notebook, I put my pencil down, my pen down, and, and forgot about it. I listened to everything he said. I tried to soak up everything the guy said. And I took probably three or four classes under Dr. Strauss in the three years that I was there. Aced them all. <laughs> the only reason I aced them all is that I, I tried to remember everything that he said, and on these essay tests, I would write down everything that I could remember. I think, I, I, I think it's probably why I aced the class. But Dr. James D. Strauss came to this girl's rescue in the middle of the intersection, in the middle of a snowstorm, and, and he gets there and, and oh, pop the hood. Pop the, and this is Dr. Strauss. Pop the hood. Pop the hood. So, he, so she pops the hood. He goes under the hood. He pulls and he pushes and he pushes and he pulls. He does this and he does that. He grunts and he groans. He comes out from under the hood. He goes, call a tow truck. Call a tow truck. Take it to my mechanic. He'll get it fixed for you. And then he reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out a wad of cash. Had to be several hundred dollars there. He pulls out a wad of cash, and he shoves it into her hands. Get it fixed. 
Dr. James D. Strauss to the rescue. You see what John's talking about here? He's talking about love in action. And that's what Dr. Strauss did that day. Love in action. And so where do we go from here today? How do we make this thing stick? <laughs> I've got a project for you. Are you ready for this? Here's your project. I want you to ask God today to help you focus on one person this week. Ask God today to help you focus on one person this week. One, not the entire team, not everybody at work, but focus on one person. It might be a neighbor of yours. It might be a teammate of yours. It might be a fellow student of yours. It might be your spouse. It might be a grandchild. It might be whomever. But focus on one person and one person only this week. And here's the second thing I want you to do. I want you to ask God not only to find a person, but I want you to ask God to help you open your eyes to see a need that that one person has. Ask God to help you see a need that that one person has. Lord, please give me eyes to see the need that they've got in their life. Focus on that one person Monday and Tuesday and through the rest of the week. Focus on that one person. And then here's the third thing that I want you to do. I want you to do something for them that's unexpected. Do something for them that's unexpected. It's going to be relatively easy to think of a person. It's going to be relatively easy to find a need. But this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it gets a little bit more difficult. Finding something that you can do for them that's unexpected. Do something. Dr. Strauss, in the middle of that snowstorm, focused on this girl and her need. He just didn't walk by like every other student on campus. He focused on her need. And I might add to this, about a week later, I was walking across campus, and there I saw this young lady driving her rattle trap of a car across campus. It was running just fine. Didn't look that great, but she is fixed and she was going. For you, it may, for you, it may be helping somebody fix their car. It may be you pulling out of your pocket 100 bucks or whatever it might cost. Hey, I'll get it fixed for you. Or it may be you getting under the hood, unlike Dr. Strauss, being able to fix it. For you, it might be a matter of paying an electric bill. Maybe sitting down with that person and just listening. Maybe crying with that person. For you, it might be making them a meal. Making them and their family a meal. But find something to do for them that's unexpected. And you know, when you stop and think about it, Jesus did a whole lot for us that was unexpected. He died on a cross for you and for me, and, and, and for me to stop and think. The Bible says, while I was still in the act of sinning, Christ died for me. While you were still in the act of sinning, Christ died for you. That's unexpected. And if you'd like to have a relationship with that, that person, Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk with you about that. Let's turn our attention right now from studying His Word. Turn our attention from studying His Word to looking at, uh, looking at communion. It talks about the death of Jesus Christ. John, you want to lead us in that? Uh, the... Scripture in the book of Acts, chapter 2, uh, says this. It says, people of Fairfield, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him. As you well know, 
But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. Communion is all about remembering what we did to Jesus. Uh, and the fact that without Christ, all of our good works, all of the, all of the love that we want to show to each other, all the love that we're going to show to the world, won't save us. All of, our, all of our good intentions and all of our good works do nothing without Christ. And so the good news that we celebrate every single week here at Fairfield is the fact that because of Jesus, we can forgive each other. We sing songs about forgiveness, like sweet, sweet honey. There's no forgiveness without Jesus. And we talk about going out and loving Kokomo. The only reason that we have any love that we can give to Kokomo is because of Jesus. Without Christ, without God reaching down to us and giving us Jesus, we're powerless. We're dead. We are doomed. And so the good news is that while we were still sinners, Christ recognized that we were helpless. And while we were still sinners, he volunteered, gave up his life, and died for us. So before he went away, he instituted, he established this communion um, because he didn't want us to forget. So it says in 1 Corinthians 11, this is Paul talking. He says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he took it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the good news, the celebration that we are about to have right now is the remembrance that Jesus makes all of it possible. Jesus makes forgiveness possible. He makes love possible. He makes joy possible. He makes eternal life possible. Um, pray with me. Lord God in heaven, we are grateful and astounded uh, at how much you love us, that you sent your son for us, and that he left heaven and came down uh, as a, a child. He left his, his glory in heaven and became a child and then died on a cross for us. Help us, Father, to use the forgiveness that you've given us, the grace that you extend us. Help us to be little mirrors for that. Help us to, to spread that to the world this week as we've been challenged to do. And help us to be grateful. Thank you for loving us and for making all of this possible. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.